Michael Grant is Professor and Vice Provost Emeritus from the University of Colorado Boulder, where he worked for 42 years in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. His primary field of research was ecological genetics and data analysis. And um, I'm sure he can tell us anything more about his past if he'd like when he's up talking. Um, today's talk is on why flowers are so beautiful, and I think that's going to be a really interesting topic. Looking forward to hearing it. So, Mike, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm Michael Grant. I retired professor of biology for the U Boulder. I've worked there for 43 years, uh, and my area is in plant biology and ecology and evolution. And one of the things that I hope today is to give you a very different perspective on flowers. Almost all of us enjoy seeing the flowers, the colors, and we plant them and we tend them, not maybe as much as we should, but we do that sort of thing. Uh, I'd like it to be pretty informal if you can, if you will. I like to have interactions, so I don't believe that. That's perfectly reasonable to tell me, and I'll try to convince you that yes, that's true or whatever. So please interact if you would. I'm, I'm very happy with that. Especially if I go over something and you didn't understand it and you want to understand it. Now if you don't want to understand it, that's fine. You can let it go. But that's up to you. So do it immediately at when we have a question at the point, waiting right? for some stopping point Just like you did just now. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. the way I want to stop. I won't stop and say, okay, now it's question time. Oh, okay. All right. It's question time anytime you have one. Okay. Can you hear me okay back here? Is that uh, okay? Fine. Uh, <clears throat> we often appreciate them and say, that flower is beautiful, this one's eh, I'm sort of okay with them. And as an evolutionary biologist, we always want to ask the question, why? As an ecologist, we say, this is the way it is. But as an evolutionist, we want to know, why is it that way? And I hope to give you a little bit of insight into why that is today. Okay. Angiosperms. We first start out with a little bit of wonkiness, botanical wonkiness, because it's job security. We have to have the uh, obscure language and terms and all of that stuff, but uh, that's job security <coughs> for us. Angiosperm is one of those. The two main <coughs> plant groups that you're mostly familiar with are angiosperms, which are the flowering plants, and gymnosperms which are the pines and the spruces and that, that group that don't produce flowers in the flame. Angiosperms represent roughly 80% of all of the uh, green plants. Another big chunk of that would be the algae so, uh, and the ferns and stuff. And so I'm going to go through a little bit of a perspective of where the angiosperms fit. And this is the wonky part, is my thing. So hang in there as, bit, as much as you will. Okay, this is an insult, not really, but what is a flower? What defines a flower? And this is what's called in technical terms a complete flower. That means it has all the parts. And so the female parts over here are the pistil, all of those together, stigma, style, ovary, and the ovule, which is the egg cell, all that makes the pistil. On the right over there, there's the uh, the anther, which is where the pollen is, and the filament, which is the supporting stalk, and that forms a stamen. And then the first whorl around uh, are petals. And that's what we normally think of as the most colorful part. And then there's another whorl right under it called sepals. And uh, so that is what is a complete angiosperm flower. Now, over evolutionary time, it's gotten more complicated and less complicated back and forth, and I'll show you a little bit of that, but I thought that might be worth starting with right here. So, this is another way of thinking about what we have. At the top up there, that says land plants. I imagine that's pretty hard to read. Yeah. <laughs> and then that's everything except the caryophytes over here on the left. These are the green algae, and uh, I've spent a lot of time working on caryophytes. And then everything up there, aquatic, strictly freshwater aquatic. And everything else is a land plant, which includes mosses, lycophytes, ferns, gymnosperms, and angiosperms. And those last four are vascular plants. That means they have the similar kinds of plumbing 
vascular tissue. And the two over the last are the gymnosperms and the angiosperms, with which most of us are familiar. They both produce seeds. Gymnosperm, gymnosperm means naked, they produce naked seeds, and the angiosperms produce covered seeds with fruits. So now this shows here when these things sort of, it, the main characteristics showed up, when it has embryo protection, when it has vascular tissue, when it has leaves, when it has seeds, when it has flowers. The flowers are over on the right. That's what we're going to talk about mostly today. Here's a, a simpler di diagram doing the thing that they all derive from the ancestral green algae. And on the left, you have the non-vascular plants of mosses, liverworts, hornworts. On the right, you have the vascular plants that includes the ferns, the gymnosperms, and the angiosperms. That's a sunflower's example. Enclosed seed and naked seed is the difference between angiosperm and gymnosperm. Mike, could you just maybe talk about vascular and non-vascular? Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, vascular system is basically your blood vessels for mm -hmm. plants. Mm -hmm. And they take up the water, they take up the nutrients from the soil, they may, uh, may produce sap as a, for various kinds of things, but mostly it's a conductive tissue that is not present in the mosses and liverworts. There the material just goes from cell to cell. It doesn't have a nice tubular uh, piping system, if okay. you will. Now here's where if we get a little bit wonky. Over here on the left, on this vertical axis, are different Paleozoic eras. From the Paleozoic to the Triassic to the Jurassic to the Cretaceous and the Cenozoic, that's the vertical axis as we become more and more recent from more and more ancient going up. And <clears throat> what I really want to emphasize is the width of these green areas. That's what's really the important. Okay, so the first green arrow is mosses. So the, the width is how diverse, how many different kinds are there? So how many different kinds of mosses does that graph show from the Paleozoic up through the Cenozoic? Has it changed? Not much, it's very stable. The same, about the same number. Well, the next one over is the ferns. What about them? What's interesting is they come and go. They had a little bit of wiggling. They had a real dry spell right here. See where it narrows? Then they expanded, and then it's narrowed and expanded. So they have a little bit more dynamic. But would you say there's a whole lot more now than there was then? No. no. You don't. <coughs> now, what about the monocotyledons? And some of you may know monocots are the grasses and, and bamboos and things of that sort that produce an initial one leaf, that's why it's called mon monocotyledon from the seed. Uh, and what about them? Now they arose in the Cretaceous. What's their pattern from the time they arose? They grew and shrink. There's getting more and more and more of them, right? You see that? Oh, the monocots. So the wider they are. Now on the right over there of the monocots, are what are called the true dicots, the eudicots. And from the Cretaceous, what did they do? They exploded. They exploded the number of kinds of different plants. Charles Darwin called this the abominable mystery, not the abominable snowman or Sasquatch, <laughs> abominable mystery. Why in the world was that so successful? Why did so many come so quickly? When, in comparison to the bosses and the ferns and the gymnosperms that have been around so long, look how different they are. That was the abominable mystery for uh, Mr. Darwin. Does that make sense to you? Yep. This is another, this has a little ecological stuff on top of it where the initial angiosperms were in the wet tropics, and so they had, they, it went out pretty, they had quite a few of them, see how it bulbs out in the early Triassic. And then there was a desertification period. And so the angiosperms only survived in what are called refugia. There's a little here, and a little plot over here, and a little plot over there. 
until the, the Cretaceous begins and then things turn wet and that's when things exploded. That's why that green is out shaped out like that. And on the right it shows a little bit of the map but I won't spend much time on that. Okay, what kind of a critter do you see? If you see a critter and it has legs and you don't know what it is, guess a beetle. That gives you the best statistical chance because there's more beetles than there are anything else in that kind of general category of plant. So that's a beetle in there. And we're talking about here in the same period where Earth starts before in the Triassic, bucking up to the Cretaceous. And what's the width of that red area? What's that telling us? Species. How many different species, how many different kinds there are? And what is the pattern from here? Whoa, enormous. A hundred, a thousand times as many as there were at the uh, origin up here. Now, and these are some other kinds of insects over here that uh, are important to pollinators, uh, but they didn't show that kind of a pattern. This is the coleopterans are the ones that show that pattern. So those are the key angiosperm pollinators. And what we have in the ecological sense is plants that want to successfully reproduce and leave offspring, which is the only thing that counts in evolution is how many offspring you leave for how long. They have to be pollinated. And so they, pollinators are scarce. Pollinators are rare. And so competition to have the pollinator come visit this flower, take the pollen to the next flower and so forth, that's a big deal. That's a very big deal in uh, plant ecology. Okay, I put this up to show some different kinds of uh, flowers. The right at the center bottom is the most ancient flower that qualifies as an angiosperm. And then if you follow the right up, uh, the line up, it actually splits and then splits again and splits again and that, that's really getting too wonky for us. But there's multiple kinds of flowers. One of the earliest flowers like a magnolia with lots and lots of petals, not simple at all from this real simple beginning. And then we also had simplification way over here on this side, it's much more simple. All I wanted to do to communicate here was that we can track these kinds of floral changes over historical time, not historical time, I shouldn't say that, over earth time, not history where we have written stuff. So how do you track them? Through fossils? Matter? Fossils, primarily. Fossils. Yeah, that's the big, and a fair amount in amber, we catch some in amber, but fossils, fossilization is the main, and uh, pollen types and fossilized, that sort of thing. Oh, oh. I think this is just plain <laughs> cute. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about pollinators. Remember I said pollinators are scarce. Their, their service is really needed uh, in things. And this is a bat and all that little glowy go uh, golden granules on there is pollen. So he's carrying a pretty big pollen load as he goes from one flower to the next flower to the next flower. I think he's kind of smiling myself. Mm -hmm. I think I see a little bit of a smile in there says I'm good for my picture. Uh, this is one that we're all very familiar with, with the long tubular flowers, with the hummingbirds. Now when I was uh, in grade school in a little town in East Texas, I was taught that the hummingbirds, the reason they could hover and they could fly backwards and they could hover was because they had four wings. Well, that's nonsense. They don't have four wings. They don't have four wings. But I believe it because that's what I was taught. They only have two and they can go forward and backwards and hover. And so that's one kind. Bird pollinate is one kind. Here's another uh, kind of a bird that's uh, doing, a, doing a pollination uh, on this particular plant. This is another kind of a pollinator. This is a, a moth popping off there. And that, they tend to have long tubular favored plants that have long tubular inflorescences to feed on. And the moths themselves are pretty. Uh, here's a, a, a useless fact that I bet it will be a surprise to you. All butterflies are moths. 
So moth is the big category, butterflies is a subcategory of the moths. People who are butterfly amateurs and collect butterflies and talk about find that insulting. <laughs> okay, there's our friend the beetles that we were showing about, the coleopterans. There's a beetle doing, a, doing his job of, of pollinating. Uh, he's not as efficient as the bee in the sense of picking up the big pollen loads, but they do have very effective pollination. Okay, now this is kind of hard to understand and see, so I'll just give you the words for it. There are orchid flowers, huge number of orchid flowers, but one group of orchids there is shaped like a female wasp, and the male wasp is as typical of males in general try to mate with it <laughs> and they actually will eject semen into the uh, receptacle of the uh, of the orchid and we have did you can take a dna test and take it out and show that that's wasp uh, semen so that's really that's what you call really fooling a pollinator is a uh, and what's the point of that? The point is always to pollinate. To get it to pollinate. Yes. Oh. And I'm doing the orchid wasp mimic. This is the orchid that is shaped like a female wasp, and the male wasps are fooled. They try to mate with it. They gather the pollen, move to the next one, and deposit some semen, which they don't help them very much on reproductive things, because <laughs> they're going to produce more wasps with that. But there's two orchids and two wasp mimics on there. I think that's one of the most interesting ecological phenomena that I know about. <laughs> there's another pollinator, honey possums. Oh. <laughs> Make a guess where those are from. Australia? This is supposed to be interactive. <laughs> Somewhere in the South Seas. South where? South Pacific. Yeah, that's good. Indonesia? No. Well, that's bigger. Australia. South America? Australia. 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 Yes, that's where it is. Those are, those are uh, not, they're not placental mammals uh, there. Those are they're just like the kangaroos there. Mm. They, uh, they have the little pouch and, and do that sort right. of thing. But that's a honey possum right there as a pollinator. What's this is one of my favorite photographs. Uh, we often think of bees as bee pollinators. Somebody had a question. I, I was asking about the flower that the honey possum was on. Uh, that's a bottle brush of some sort. I don't know which specific one. Okay. Um, that bee has been busy, <laughs> would, you, would you say? That's really transferring a lot. That's, that's one of the primary functions. If you've ever seen uh, close-ups of bees, they have all these little hairs and things on them. That's uh, sticking on my pollen is uh, one of the reasons that that happens. Okay, I, want to, I gave a little overview of the uh, flower structure to begin with, and I'm going to do that again a little bit more here. Um, this, and this flower has three sort of semi-fused petals up on top and two very much fused petals uh, a, a, a big petal on the bottom and two separate ones on the side. So it's got five petals there. Can you see those? All right. Mm -hmm. Now, where is the pistil? Remember that's the female portion? Can you see the pistil? The bottom. The bottom. It's there the in the bottom of the flower. Little white that's the white little the knob. That little white knob, that's the pistil. Where's the anther that the pollen is? I think those two the things dark are the, ones? the dark the purples up there. Now, so if a bee goes in there, where is a bee going to land into that flower? Oh, yeah. It's going to land on that bottom petal, and the anthers will dock down and drop on that top of it, and he will carry some to the next petal. So you, this one over to the side, you can see the structure and they're pretty good. So that's the functionality of that particular shape of the flower to maximize the efficiency of the pollinators that visit. But the pollen has to get on the pistol for anything. Yes, but if you try, you want it not on the pistil of this flower because that's inbreeding. You want it on the pistil of the next flower and the next plant and next load so that you maximize genetic diversity. 
Right, but the next flower is going to be the same design. Right? No, it may be a hundred miles away or twenty miles away. But it's still going to have the pistol. But they, the they do put it on the same thing. But but there are uh, mechanisms to minimize the amount of success by that inbreeding. Yeah. It works best if it goes to an entirely different plant. I see. Okay. Others? I stuck this one in there to talk a little bit about the diversity of shapes of flowers. That's one of the things that's fun. And, and we have. Uh, some five petals and we have clusters and we have lots of colors and we have many many petals down there and fused petals over here and completely fused down in the calla lily down there all those petals are fused together uh, so I just put that in to indicate to you how we see a lot of diversity in these flower structures uh, and now I'm going to show you something else. I'm going to try to convince you that even though there's a lot of diversity here in these flower structures, there are some underlying principles, some fundamental characteristics that are secrets to the success of the angiosperms. For those of you who came in late, one of the tasks of evolutionary biology is try to answer Darwin's abominable mystery. Why did so many angiosperm flowering plants occur so rapidly in the geological record? How that made them go so fast? And I'm going to try to show you some of the reasons that that happened. I'm curious with all those different petal structures. Does that have anything to do with the type of pollinators that will likely be in that area? Yes. Okay. And I'll give you some more specifics about that in just a minute. Sure will. Okay. What do you see up in the top left up there besides W-A-T-A-T? -A -T? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Seeds. 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 Lots those of are, little seeds. Those are flowers. Did the wheel turn in the oh, seeds? they're flowers. Mm. And in the rice, those are flowers. The potato looks more like an ordinary, what we think of as a flower. Down in the bottom left, the oak flower. Many people say, I didn't know oaks had flowers. Because they're, they're so inconspicuous and small. And that's rock, uh, walnut in the middle, and there's a clover, a legume, on the lower right. So those are pretty important flowers. Why are they important? To we eat them. Eat them. Yeah. That's our big food supply between wheat, rice, and potato. That's a, and legumes. That's a big share of what we as humans consume, or we feed it to another critter and then consume that critter. Uh, so those are very fundamental. So how come they don't look like that flower I showed you, the complete flower, when we started this way? What's going on there? Wind pollinating? Those are wind pollinating. And the wind does not have any discrimination capabilities. Okay. So the wind, it just blows it. So the, the things that are being maximized in these kinds of flowers is how well it floats in the air and distributes and goes to the long distances and gets to the others. So those are wind pollinated plants. Okay, we're gonna now put on glasses that a bumblebee or a honeybee has. Our spectrum, we go from, uh, from red, uh, infrared and purple, you know, you know what our visible spectrum is. And that's what we think of as flowers. Well, bees have a different spectrum of the light spectrum that they uh, react to. So look at the flower on the left. That's in regular white light that we normally have from the sun. What kind of structure do you see in that yellow flower? Looks pretty bland, doesn't it? Nothing much special there. But if we put it under UV light in one of the bands that bees see, now what do you see? You see a lot of structure. And here's one of the principles I'm going to emphasize over and over, is that's the actual the same, bud, the same flower. You can see the petals more distinctly, and you see those lines pointing to the middle, right. and target. the target right in the very center because that's where they need the pollinator to go in order to be function. So that target structure is one of the fundamental characteristics of wildflowers that are insect pollinated. There's another yellow, not too interesting up there, 
but look at it under UV light. Again, concentric circles like targets going right to the middle to guide the pollinator into where they to be most effective. And we don't see that. All we see is this over here when we go out and enjoy the flowers. But now that you know it, you can think it. <laughs> you can see, again, the uh, concentric circles that are going in. So, yeah, um, the bees have unique capabilities to see. What about the beetle and the moth? They have different spectra, and, and that shifts which flowers they go to and which ones don't. I don't have any uh, of the beetle spectra. I did have ones of the bees. So I took that as an example. But it does translate to other kinds of pollinators that might have different sensitive uh, visual apparatus. So when did they discover this, the difference between the white light and the UV light? Uh, this has been known for about 20 years. 20 years? Oh, well, we had to get the apparatus to be able to figure out to have the bee tell us what it could see. And the way they did that was in, in the laboratory where you had bees and you had rewards that had different color lights, different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum shining. And the bee would tell you which one they could see and which one they couldn't see. And that took, took quite a while to, to get figured out uh, to do that. Yeah. What about birds? Uh, what birds. about birds? Birds. Same thing. Oh. Same thing. Now birds often also have the geometric. Remember most of the bird pollinators are, uh, tend to be like hummingbirds and they want a long tubular flower. And so that long tubular flower will have that same circle concentric so that they can get their proboscis all the way down into where the, uh, where the uh, nectar is and do the pollen. But so the same kind of process works for all of these animal pollinators. Not just that, there are olfactory ones, and I'll tell you a little bit about some olfactory ones in a, in a bit. Just curious, if we had like UV goggles, could we see that? You, you need to, the, the answer is yes, you can. If you can get your, if you can get a device that gives you the UV spectrum translated into what your rods and cones can recognize. I was thinking like the UV night glasses. Uh, I think they work, I've never tried them. Okay. But I would think that they work, yes. Okay, this is the most primitive flower uh, that uh, we know that still exists. That's what we mean by an extant flower. So it still exists in various places in uh, Africa mostly. And you see how leafy the, uh, the fleshy the petals are around and how simple the structure is. Uh, I just thought I'd put that in because it is extant and it's one of the most ancient ones. Now what I wanted to do is spend a little bit of time showing you some interesting flowers that, not, that won't em emphasize this fundamental property any more than what I've already emphasized. This is an, uh, an orchid, another orchid, and it has a landing area, it has a dip on it, and if I had the UV, it would show you how it would guide the pollinators in. I don't have it, but it would show it if, uh, if we had it. So I'm just going to try to give you a few interesting flowers. Now, all of the people who have taken these photographs, and this wasn't me, aware that these are not photoshopped. These are not a touch up. These are trying to be histo uh, accurate. Now, this is a flowering plant that doesn't know any of the rules to how to be a flowering plant. <laughs> it does not have vascular tissue, xylem and phloem. It does not have roots. It does not have a stem. And it only has what are called hostoria, which are sort of like fungal hyphae. And it's, on, it's a parasite, semi-parasite, and it absorbs nutrient from its host. And that's a rafflesia is what its name is. But it sort of looks like a regular flower, but to a botanist, it just is a clunker. It just doesn't look right at all. It has simplified all of that to specialize in this particular ecological habitat. I'll show you another picture too. See? How big is that? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at you. Wow. 
<laughs> Those are the ones that also smell pretty bad. Yes, of course. This, okay, that's where we're going to go. This is the olfactory one. These smell like rotten meat, and flies uh, are one of their major pollinators. And this, this big old thing right here. So yes, and we have one here. Do any of you know Premlet Perry's Primrose? It's uh, up in along the streams up in the mountains. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perry's primrose is a plant about this high, got a bright red flower, some kind of thing you notice when you go, oh, look at that, that's really pretty. And you take a whiff of it and here you throw up. It's just got a rotten egg smell, rotten meat smell that's just terrible. And that's the same kind of thing as with Rufflesia here. I was touching one and then washed my hands and I could still smell it. So my hands. You're, you're confirming that I'm not telling the fib. No, I, I like the smell, but oh. unusual. Well, drop meat is not usually what we like, but that's okay. <laughs> to each his own. Okay, this Rafflesia that I was just talking about has what's called horizontal transfer of genes. Now, this is a pretty new concept in the last 20 years or so is most all the evolutionary biology and evolutionary genetics I studied when I was in grad school and so forth is that these, these genes are within a lineage. So you have this lineage separate from this lineage. Horizontal transfer means they go from one to the other. And Rafflesia has a good bit of horizontal transfer from the host plant that it grows on. And those are uh, known in bacteria. Bacteria do that all the time, but not in the higher organisms. And this is in the mitochondria. Mitochondria are the organelles that generate the energy to run your metabolism and do everything else. Mitochondria are the workhorse in uh, living cells, both plants and animals. And so they have ex exchanged genes of mitochondria, presumably to the benefit of both of them, but certainly to the benefit of Rathlesia. Through the air. No, through the hostoria. See, the plant, the uh, Rafflesia grows, this is, a, say, that's the tree. The Rafflesia grows on there and has hostoria that figure out all out and through the web. And that's where the transfer takes place. Pretty amazing, I think. Okay, there's another flower. Pretty interesting flower. Huh? And there's you, a, a five foot six, five foot eight kind of person there for scaling. That's it called a morphophallus. So what is it that we have like at the New Rotanic Gardens that blooms every whatever? Yeah. It's, it's a, a rare bloomer, but there are a bunch of plants that are rare bloomer, but okay. this is one of them. I don't know whether they have an amorphophallus at the Denver Botanic Garden or not. I don't know the answer to they that. They call it the quartz flower. They do call it the quartz yeah. flower? Okay. And I haven't heard that term that term before. But there it is. It's amorphophallus titanica. And you can guess where, why that was named this particular way without too much uh, imagination. Uh, but that is a heavy and I stuck in one of my favorite little flowers, an alpine plant, that the alpine forget me not. It's a half inch compared to, you can see the people standing over to the left where I'm measuring the scale of that uh, Titanica plant. 12, 15 feet or something, huh? Uh, yes, it, it's about 10 feet. Where do those normally grow? Um, this is an, uh, an African plant, and I don't remember whether it's East Africa or West Africa, but it's an African plant. What and it may get up in the Southeast Asia. Does it have a special pollinator that works it, with it? It, it has uh, mostly beetles. Beetles? It has a lot of beetle pollinators that crawl all over it, because there, apparently there's a lot of food supply there. Um, this is another very different kind of a flower. All the white fringy stuff up at the top, those are flowers. That's on the top of palm. That's in, in Indonesia, primarily. So another very different kind of flower. And somebody had asked me, do we have different kinds of pollinators for different kinds of circumstances? And this is a good example of uh, that fits this particular ecological situation. What the specific pollinators are for this, I don't know. I didn't bother to try to track it down. But obviously, they work there very well. 
for that particular poem. As I said, I'm just trying to show you some photographs of what I think are interesting flowers. <laughs> and what are you just going to say? What are you going to talk to me about? Huh? <laughs> see, you can even see his jubilee back there. See the. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Now, as I told you earlier, that the photo uh, photographers that posted these said these were not retouched, not photo touched. I remain a little skeptical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these two been happy. Okay, so to review, some of you missed the first part. The first part was to show how the coleopters, the pollinators, expanded enormously in the Cretaceous in terms of number of species, hugely coinciding with the expansion of the flowers, the number of kinds of flowers. That's the Bar Darwin's abominable mystery. And the explanation is that competition for pollinators coincided, and you had diversification in the uh, coleoptons and the pollinators, and diversification in the flowers, and that's what caused Darwin to worry so much about why flowers are so beautiful. Did he figure that out before he No, he did not. He did not. And it's because the pollinators think the flowers are beautiful, not because we think yeah. they're is there, is there cross-pollination between species? That, yes, there is cross-pollination between species. Some some is very easy, to, uh, kind of low barriers to cross pollinate. Some are very sharp and steep and don't cross pollinate. Uh, but but we have in our commercial plants uh, wheats and sorghums and uh, wheats and, and barley and that sort of thing. We can force them to cross pollinate. You can do it with buffalo and cattle. You can force them to sort of cross breed and things. So the answer is yes. And that makes it sort of hard to say this is a species which we always thought was genetically isolated from other species, but this transfer of genes makes that um, difficult to try to understand and play. But the rule is generally they don't cross pollinate, but they can in some places. The end. <laughs> Questions and, and when I don't know, I'll tell you. Yeah, but I think it's interesting. You're going to talk about fragrance. Is that all? Oh, the fragrances, and that's right. I should. I did do a little bit of that. Rafflesia is one, and the St. John's. Uh, 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 what did that? What's the name of that plant? I just said it a minute ago. Uh, Fairy's primrose. Those are olfactory signals that are used in rotten meat or something of that sort. So there are fra fragrances and birds will pick up on the fragrances even though birds don't have, as a general rule, they don't have much olfactory thing. Buzzards are real good at olfactory and some others. But so there is that. And I have concentrated on the visual in this particular talk because I start from the premise that we think colorful flowers are beautiful because we can see that they're in our electromagnetic spectrum range. That's why I focus on that instead of Most of the olfactory stuff is chemistry. I have to show you organic chemical science and things, and I thought that probably wouldn't work as well. Or have sample belts just packed around. Well, I could do that, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't do that. Other questions? Yes? So the, the continuing on that one, the, um, the visible spectrum flowering color has no translation in the ultraviolet. No, I, it, 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 it does not go, that is yellow doesn't always go this way or red always goes, so there's no specific translation. But the bees can see some of the visible spectrum that we can, so both things can take place. Okay. So it may go to a yellow flower first and then as it gets closer then it sees the, the ultraviolet sort of thing to hum it in. So, so there is some overlap. But, yeah, but you can't say a yellow flower is going to look like this one or a red one's going to look like that in the UV. Or there could be other adaptations where the, vis where the visible spectrum uh, coloring. Yes, there are other things. That's right. Uh -huh. But um, the question I actually had was, uh, I was curious if you could say more about the 
uh, self pollination minimization scheme? Is it an auto? Okay, uh, we'll we'll do that next month. Okay. It's a whole topic, okay. but I'll start with it here. In general, evolutionary success in species are best when they maximize genetic diversity. If gen genotypes are different from each other and not homogeneous, being the same. And selfing, of course, reduces the gene pool from which the samples are taken. So selfing, you've heard of inbreeding depression, or some of you've heard it. And it does things like, for example, the human custom is you don't marry anyone that is a first cousin or closer in relative. And that's to avoid the inbreeding, which would cause developmental problems and things of that sort. You want outbreeding. You want somebody that's genetically very different from you to raise healthy healthy progeny. And that is true across the across the uh, board. Uh, fine trees around here, you, they, if you paid attention, mostly the female cones, the cones that you think of, are up high in the tree. The little pollen producers tend to be down low in the tree. And that's to reduce the amount of pollen that goes to the same tree. To pollinate those seeds that are low, it's supposed to get picked up by the wind and go to other trees. And there are, in many animals, there are a lot of behavioral characteristics that are evolved to keep, uh, to minimize inbreeding. And one of the big dangers we have when we raise wheat or corn or barley is that we want them all to mature at the same time. We want them to grow to the same height so that we can harvest them. We want them to have the same flavor. So we try to go to as an agriculturist to a homogeneity of genetics. And that's a real risk, like the potato famine, because the potato famine in, in Ireland was an infectious disease that really wiped out the potato crop. So the more homogeneous you are, the higher your risk of losing a big bunch. On the other hand, if you have a lot of genetic diversity, you may lose this one and this one and this one, but there's six more that can make it. Is that what you wanted to... Yeah, and then good? I guess specifically in the, the flower example you showed that uh, these particular part, the dark violet dot right. parts, are not going to dot down and fertilize this one, so it's going to face the thing like the edge. That's the right. There are that's the geometric arrangement in there, and that was what I was talking about with pine trees. That's the geometric arrangement that's part of it. Uh -huh. it Thank you. Oh, I'm the factory um, plants. The ones that smell like rotten meat, do those attract flies? Yes. And, and do they pollinate? Uh, yes, flies can pollinate. Them. And mosquitoes can, too. I have seen a mosquito with uh, two pollinia stuck right to his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a personal observation. Yes, sir. Uh, well, Greg, kind of related to a couple of questions. Um, do other pollinators have maybe a different spectrum view so yes they will they'll have species specific but how much they are and how much they overlap i have not worked that up uh, but i i feel pretty comfortable in saying that they're not all the same as the bees they'll be a little lower a little higher it can be on the other end of the spectrum as well as on the short end of the spectrum so i, I would think so okay and then uh, the old factory the smell they have Obviously, they don't. They're, some of the scents, like the wolf leaves, are horrid. But you know, roses—they smell wonderful. Some others do. Are those all for birds, or do some pollinators maybe have that sense? I, I don't know of any case where the the uh, uh, domesticated plants, like roses, that we have for all factory reasons, uh, are connected to wild pollinators. That doesn't mean they aren't. But I don't know of any study that says they are. Those seem to be strictly for human consumption. But some of the wildflowers smell. Oh, they do smell. Nice. And, and I suspect that they're important. I just haven't seen it demonstrated. Yeah. Now, because I haven't seen it doesn't mean it had been. But I don't know about biologists. One have a lot more than what I do know about biology. <laughs> So can we say something about uh, Darwin's abominable question? And in particular, I noticed slide two after that, the beetles and the flowering plants exploded at the same time. So there's a cross, so That's who it. came first, but That's still some other factor 
potentially contributed to the, well, the, the thought now, the best thought now, is that the primary driving factor was not external like temperature or moisture or something. It was all a good growing climate for a good long period of time. And it was the interaction, the competition between them back and forth that is what caused the explosion in both, both lineages. Mm -hmm. I, I can put that back up. <coughs> Some of you came in late, so you didn't get to see it. Okay, this is what we were talking about. See, on the left is the coleoptas, those big red ones, that's the beetles. And they exploded at the same time as the angiosperms did, which I had already shown. No, I went the wrong way. Okay, so I started with this to d define what Darwin's abominable mystery was. Do you see how fast they d proliferated? The width of the green is what's impressive compared to the mosses, which didn't really do much. The ferns did a little in and out, a little in and out. The gymnosperms, the pines and things, they expanded and now they've contracted a little bit. At the time, the monocots, that's a, a flowering plant, and the eudicots, that's a flowering plant, they exploded tremendously. Why that? That's what Darwin defined as his abominable mystery. And the explanation now is that coincident with that, both of them explained the, the pollinators and the flowers interacted with each other, each increasing the diversity of the other in a coevolutionary interaction. Well, that would be cross-pollination. Well, it's not technically cross-pollination. Because pollination means moving pollen from one species to the other. There are other reasons that, th that these are insect uh, uh, pollinators often are specialists. And so if a plant has a successful tr attraction for this particular pollinator, and that pollinator works pretty well, it may only pollinate this one plant, this one species. And that's not cross-pollination. But th there are it's coevolution is what I think you're thinking about rather than cross-pollination. Now, for example, here we have the yucca plant, the yucca glauca. Uh, that's pollinated by the yucca moth. And that's the only thing that it pollinates. And it lays its eggs inside, it eats part of the seeds, burrows a hole and comes out. It doesn't eat all the seeds. And the yucca is dependent on that particular one pollinator. Specialization. What type of person does this type of work, to all this research to find out? How much does it take? No, what type of, uh, what's the name of the job of the person oh. who does that? Uh, but they, this is paleontology. Oh. So, um, then you're saying here that a lot of insect or other pollinator populations also kind of grew up at the same time and then they expanded they together. Yeah. They, they diversified simultaneously, each increasing the diversity of the other, different kinds, yes. That's the explanation currently in the literature of Darwin's abominable mystery. They find little micro niches, right? Oh yeah, yes, yeah. there, like there, there are, this, this is a adaptive radiation is the general term for this, and they radiate into little spots that work for this one. So the plants that grow in the swamps will have pollinators that live in the swamps, and the plants that grow in the dry desert will have a pollinators that live in the dry desert and so forth. So the, yes, that's the ecological diversity that goes on top of the taxonomic diversity. So what is, there, is that at the bottom of the, the cone there, which that's the origins of the, that's as far back as we have records. Tim, yeah, what era is it? This? Oh, so what era is it? That's in the Permian. Okay. So right this here. Is, yeah. this, this is the Permian right here. Okay. Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and the Cenozoic. we we'll go back a couple of steps. It's probably Cambrian. Then down here at the bottom of the park was the Silurian, the Devonian, and the, the, uh, then the uh, Carboniferous. Okay. A little later, no, they, I am not a good geologist, so I, I have to just use my cues. <laughs> why, why is there such an explosion at the top? Well, that's because the flowers were exploding. They had the opportunity to be successful pollinators and gather the pollen. That's 
that explosion is, I want you to think of it as over those several hundreds of thousands of years. It wasn't just last week kind of thing. But that's the mystery. That's the explanation for the plant mystery. Both of them did that same thing. Biodiversity. Yes, it is biological diversity. So would our hypothesis be that maybe both are tapering now in the last hundreds of years? No, not yet. But we do have extinctions. And we have extinctions that are higher than what is called background rate of extinction. Always extinctions are going on. But we are disturbed in enough habitats and enough places that we're accelerating the extinction in various places. But there's about 248,000 angiosperm species right now. And there's like 500,000 coleopterans. So those as groups are not many problems. But a particular species and a particular location could be a problem. And then follow up is our hypothesis about the grasses tapering. That it was due to, again, an interaction with their loss of pollinators, perhaps? Grasses are wind pollinating. Oh, I see. Because the grasses tapered on the green chart. Yeah. I don't know the answer to why that is. Let me look at that again. Where do you see the grasses? I thought the third, the middle one is grasses. No, that's monocots. Okay, let me get over here where I can read. This is the mosses. These are the ferns. And these are the gymnosperms. And these are the angiosperms on that bracket over there. So the tapering in the middle one would be? Well, those are ecological conditions. And this is over thousands of years. It got drier, got more and more. There are specific information to go with it. I don't have it to get to. But there is specific knowledge. Back on the chart that's red, what was the one to the farthest right? Kind of broad. Yeah, the one on the farthest right. Those are different kinds of insects. They're megalopterous, the rapidoides, the neuropter. Those are different kinds of, not insects, but animalia that are in that category. And I'm not expert enough to tell you. But what you can see is that they don't explode in the same way the coleopterans do. Which is all I was. Does the far right look have a name on the top? The coleopterans? The far right red. Yeah, it's a neuroptera. Okay, we can't read from here. That's why. Well, I can read it, but I don't know what to tell you it is. I can't give you an example of what a neuropteran is. I can find it. It's not a beetle. It is something else. That's a scar. That's correct. Other questions? And then in regard to bees, we hear so much about loss of bees and risk of bee extinction. Can we think about that in terms of this kind of information? Yes, we certainly can. And there's sort of two categories of the bee loss we have. One of them is the economic category, which is the honeybee loss, which pollinates some of our most important economic crops. And those are not native. Those are invaded. Those honeybees were brought from the continent, European continent, or from the African continent. You may have heard of Africanized honeybees. And so those are worker bees, and they're very abundant. We depend on them now. They become what's called naturalized. They successfully reproduce here. But there's been some diseases in them. And again, the genetic diversity is probably down amongst the honeybees. The other category is in our native bumblebees. And most of that is due to habitat loss. That they don't have places to build their nest. Sometimes it's in the ground and various things. And so that is what we might call background extinction that's being aggravated by our expansion into places where they would normally be. So those are two different categories. But yes, but this is probably in either neither case is it because of the lack of diversity in the flowers they pollinate. If you go up in the Alpine, the bees are doing really pretty well up in the Alpine because we don't build very many racetracks and 
and concrete to place up there. So they do pretty well up there. I was going to add that I read somewhere that most of our bees we have down here are ground dwellers. So in your yards and gardens, you need to leave some open space ground for them to be ground dwellers if you want to have pollinators. Yeah, that's, that, that's a specific detail of what we were talking about, yeah. it just being human interference mm -hmm. with their natural capabilities. Okay, so I looked up Neuroptera, whatever that is on the Neuroptera? They're, they're insects that have four uh, wings, lacy wings. Oh, okay. Then the neuropter then would be yeah, like lace, 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 lace. yeah, like lace wings. But not hummingbirds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that's where it started. That you could see four wings on the benzo flies and dragonflies, yeah, was, and they can go back. So well, the hummingbirds must have that too. <laughs> I'm just guessing right. here. Okay. All they had to do was look at it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> Give up? Okay, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.